it over to Scott. And Scott is with StyleWise Partners, who has been with us every week for this entire series. And we are thankful to you for keeping us going, keeping us connected and informed and leading us. So with that, Scott, please take over and we'll look forward to what you have to say today. Thank you, Miss Wendy. It has been my pleasure to be a part of this uh, Connect 40 series that the Bedford Area Chamber of Commerce has put together. So thank you very much. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to join you. You are right, Wendy. This is another surefire bang up lineup that you have put together for today. We have with us uh, Mr. Brince Manning, who is from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And so we're going to get a chance to, to chat with him. Following uh, Brince, we'll check in with our friends over at Centra Health. Our Chief Transformation Officer, Michael Elliott, is back with us again this week to give us another update from a healthcare perspective. Then we'll go back to the HR world, and we're lucky enough to have Rachel Tobin back with us. She's an HR leader for uh, Commercial Steel up in Madison Heights, so she'll give us uh, some more information, latest and greatest from an HR perspective. Uh, then we will bring it home talking about the money. Show me the money and talk about what are the tax implications of the money. So we have Crystal Ockershuk. She has her own uh, CPA firm in Bedford, serves the greater area. And uh, we will uh, we'll close with Crystal this week. So thank you to all of our panelists for being here. As we've mentioned in weeks before, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the chat button. That's a great way to communicate during our, um, our process here today. And the first thing we'd like you to use that chat button for is, uh, because it was mentioned, this is Mother's Day weekend. And I don't know that there's anyone more special on the face of this earth than our mothers. So what I would love for folks to do and I'll, uh, I'll go first to give you a little time to think of your example that you want to share too. But what's one of your favorite Mother's Day memories? What's one of your favorite Mother's Day memories? So I'll, uh, I'll give you one of mine. My poor mother, she, uh, she was a trooper. She, uh, she's still with us. She has suffered from claustrophobia her whole life. So like going on Disney rides and things like that, you know, she just kind of suffered through it. One Mother's Day, we went to a place in upstate New York called Howe's Caverns. It's like Larray Caverns. Um, and we went down, you know, into this, into this tight little walkway in between uh, all these rocks and boulders and stuff. And then they did that surprise move where they shut the lights off. And I thought my poor mother was going to die. And it was, it was so, so cruel of us, but we were just cracking up laughing. And it became like this big joke in the family of when, you know, we went out for Mother's Day to, to treat mom to a nice event and we take her to this cave and she ends up uh, getting claustrophobic attack. So um, kind of a weird memory. I know I'm a little bit off sometimes, as you can tell with the sport coat, but it was one of our favorite Mother's Day memories out there. So anybody else, any favorite Mother's Day memory that you can share via chat and then Wendy will, uh, Wendy will share that with us. Great. So that was a good story. I love the stories. And um, Rachel is saying that her kids skated down to Jamba Juice when they lived in California. And her a favorite drink and breakfast in bed Aww. and uh, said, how did you get, how did you get this knowing my husband wasn't home? I was shocked and they left the house. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's great Jamba juice breakfast in bed Good awesome deal. any others out there all right well we encourage you to think about how you want to celebrate your mom either uh, if you're lucky enough to be face to face or uh, at a safe distance um, via virtual technology uh, even if it's just in memory spend a little time with your mom on Sunday and uh, enjoy the moment. So with that, let us turn it over to our representative, Brince Manning from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Brince, thank you very much for joining us uh, this Friday, and we, we appreciate your time, appreciate what you do from the U.S. Chamber perspective. So turn it over to you, and uh, again, thanks for being here. 
Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you for having me. I know this is not an easy time for a lot of businesses out there, but um, hopefully you're able to sort of get through this and we'll get back on the better side of things uh, shortly. So I'm gonna jump right in. I'm gonna talk real fast because I've got a lot to cover uh, my notes here and not a lot of time. Uh, so hold tight, hang in there, and let's get through this. So as we begin to look forward to businesses reopening around the country, um, I want to go over a few things that we're thinking about when it comes to what needs to happen to get back to work. Uh, some of the issues that are arising, particularly in states that have already begun the process. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the White House released their guidelines for returning to work. Um, so businesses are beginning to prepare for a reopening. Some of the things that we're encouraging them to look at and think about are social distancing, uh, cleaning programs and employee uh, symptom mon monitoring or temperature checking. A lot of companies are either uh, being required to or are voluntarily conducting temperature checks. It's not a requirement at the moment, uh, but you may want to think about how that uh, could be implemented um, if, if we are eventually forced to, uh, to do that. Also, sanitation cleaning will be imperative as well as personal protection equipment. Uh, such as masks. Uh, the two issues we're particularly pushing for more guidance and clarity are um, the role of employers in monitoring the workforce for indicative symptoms uh, for your employees' health, but also uh, policies and procedures for testing and contact tracing. Uh, these are areas where most employers have never had any role whatsoever, uh, and this raises a lot of questions about the medical privacy and how we might protect workers and their privacy but also comply with certain guidelines. Uh, the White House also released guidelines for employers in each of, each of the phases for reopening. Uh, phase one, uh, I really wanna draw your attention to closing down all common areas uh, and strictly enforcing social distancing. Uh, these are important first steps to reopening and should be uh, where you're, uh, and sh it should be where you're beginning to think about, uh, think through uh, how this works for your business. Also, you'll see uh, special recommendations for vulnerable, vulnerable populations, uh, which uh, are individuals based on age, individuals above age of uh, 65, as well as people with underlying health issues. Uh, here, we've raised a number of concerns with regard uh, to employers, if they're, if they're providing special accommodations, making sure there's a safe harbor with regard to discrimination laws that prevent some types of special accommodation uh, on the basis of age. So we're worried about some conflicts here between some of the recommendations and some of the requirements under existing laws. Uh, obviously, there are some requirements for specific employers, in particular um, uh, businesses where people congregate uh, in large groups. Uh, so think about restaurants, bars, um, obviously movie theaters, et cetera, uh, other places where um, the business model requires a lot of folks getting together at one time. Uh, that's clearly not going to happen for an extended period of time, uh, particularly not to full capacity. So we're thinking through these types of uh, special accommodations or programs to support them if they're going to survive. Beyond the White House recommendations, we at the U.S. Chamber are thinking through other return to work issues, as I mentioned before. Um, what's the role uh, of employers in testing, tracing, and health monitoring? Uh, we know uh, some large employers are already implementing testing programs for their employees. employees. Uh, we're, we've talked to a lot of other large employers who are less inclined um, to do that, and a lot of mid-size and smaller businesses who simply don't have the capacity to do so, um, to do the on-site testing um, uh, for their employees. Uh, we believe that that's going to require a, a pretty robust third-party tracing system, uh, probably in addition to normal health care providers, uh, whether that means pharmacists or uh, some of these drive-through facilities at major retail locations. Uh, a new concern that's emerging is this question of whether these new practices and procedures are uh, issued through guidance or regulation. Uh, so to date, uh, CDC and OSHA, for example, have issued guidance for employers. Um, there's a push among some in Congress, uh, New York Times editorial recently uh, editorialized in favor of this, 
to convert guidance into regulations, uh, which would not be ideal. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of states that do the same uh, with their own guidance. Uh, we're quite concerned that if this becomes a one-size-fits-all regulatory approach, it's going to be very difficult for a lot of employers uh, to get back to work. Another way employers uh, can be in trouble is legal liability. Uh, my colleagues at the U.S. Chamber uh, in the Litigation Center have been tracking over 300 different lawsuits that have been filed uh, in this period when things have been closed down. In some states, we're seeing advertisements on TV uh, of, by trial lawyer firms actually looking for people to become clients so that they can go sue someone. Uh, this is not just a theoretical concern. This is, this is actually happening. Now, the type of liability protections we're talking about are, in particular, exposure lawsuits. Uh, ones where businesses are taking all the precautions that the CDC, OSHA, and other public health authorities recommend, but invariably either an employer or a customer um, uh, can, uh, gets the virus and then alleges that the business should have done more. Uh, remember, this is a, a pretty unprecedented time uh, situation. Businesses will want to step up and do the right thing, but we know that um, we know how this virus works and um, In doing all the right things. It's it's just tough to control the spread uh, There are a lot there have been a lot of reports of unsafe workplaces particularly uh, meat packing plants for example that have had large outbreaks uh, These reports uh, are now being used as examples of why we need regulations on employers um, others are concerned that liability protections would make it harder for ordinary people to have legal recourse. But the U.S. Chamber is not asking for immunity, we're asking for a safe harbor. So in the case where the CDC, OSHA, and uh, state public health authorities issue recommendations, um, and a business does its best to comply with those recommendations, uh, that should be a safe harbor for them against those, uh, against types of frivolous lawsuits. If a business is grossly negligent, negligent, for example, if they are willfully forcing employer uh, workers to work in unsafe conditions, then they don't have that liability protection. Um, what we don't want, no one wants uh, to protect bad actors here. Uh, the businesses who are trying to do the right thing shouldn't be second guessed a year later in a court of law. Uh, we're also not asking for these liability protections to last forever. We believe they should be temporary. Uh, we know uh, we're gonna beat this virus, and when we do, uh, we, should revert, we should revert back to the status quo, but we realize uh, we need immediate, temporary, targeted relief to give business owners the surety and certainty that they need to reopen and not have to worry about lawsuits. Uh, we are hopeful that the next round of coronavirus legislation that I'll touch on in a minute uh, will include some form of liability protection for our country's businesses. And Senate Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell has already expressed that no legislation will pass the Senate without, um, without that. Uh, so I know I don't have a ton of time. I, I want to touch on a couple things real quick. Um, there's uh, this patchwork of rules that's going around 50 different states, 50 different, 50 different uh, types of rules, all the different jurisdictions. Um, you know, it, it's a problem for a lot of businesses, and uh, we're working with Congress to address that in the next phase bill, phase four. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. And also, speaking of the phase four bill, um, don't expect anything to be passed and signed by the president before Memorial Day. Uh, the House is going to come out next week, I, I believe next week, with uh, a new bill. It's going to be a it's going to cost about a trillion dollars, um, so that be on the lookout for that. But Senate Republicans don't have much of an appetite to add another trillion dollars to the deficit right now, on top of the nearly three trillion that they've already done uh, to this point. So be on the lookout for that, and uh, that's all I have. I'll pass the mic. Friends, thank you very much. A lot of good information there, and I, I wish we had a whole hour just for the for the U.S. Chamber. We can uh, certainly uh, gather a lot of information from you. So again, thank you very much. We appreciate it, and um, let us move on from there to our, our good friends at Central Health. Michael Elliott, thank you for being back with us, and uh, while you get set here, I will 
pull up our presentation and we should be good to go. Excellent. Thanks, Scott. And uh, great presentation, Brent. That was uh, great information. And Michael, your volume is a little bit low. If you can uh, speak up for us, that'd be awesome. All right, so is that better? Yes, sir. All right, sounds great. Well, once again, thanks, Brent. Thanks for the opportunity just to speak through a couple of things. And uh, I was always taught uh, when you're presenting, tell folks what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. If you really want to be good at communicating, just keep telling folks the same thing until they say, stop, uh, we got it. And then you tell them about 10 more times. <laughs> especially when it's important. And that's why our first slide continues to be uh, flattening the curve. And while the thanks are going around, I want to continue to thank everybody uh, who's on this call that's in leadership positions as well. Um, do not let the people that you love, do not let the people who are under your employee and leadership get lackadaisical. We have, uh, we have absolutely flattened the curve. And the only way that it continues to stay there is that we do not become lackadaisical. As a matter of fact, if anything, we pick up our intensity, especially as things start to open back up. Next slide. Uh, just to look at some of the numbers from last Thursday to this Thursday, uh, number of people tested has continued to increase. Uh, that's up by about 46,000 uh, from last week. The number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 are up by about 6,000 from this week last time. And also the number of hospitalizations is up by about 600. Um, total number of deaths uh, for the state is up by about 600, excuse me, uh, 200 uh, deaths from last week. Next slide. In our own district, uh, once again, the number in parentheses is where we were last week. So we have uh, confirmed a few more cases, uh, seven more in Bedford County, and we are still steady at two deaths from COVID-19. As far as Lynchburg General and Southside Community Hospitals are concerned, they're the only two of our four hospitals listed because those are uh, the two hospitals that are seeing COVID-19 patients. We had a, a whopping total of five inpatients uh, last week, and that number has gone up to, as of yesterday, we had nine uh, inpatients. So uh, we have not been overwhelmed by any means. Flattening the curve has absolutely worked. Next slide. So this is straight from the governor's desk. Uh, this was a part of his presentation from uh, Monday of this week. And I just wanted to reiterate a couple of the items that are there. So stay at home will be transitioning to something called safer at home. Uh, which essentially means you can go out to some of the non-essential businesses that will be opening. Um, but after that, you really do need to get back home. And so whether the terminology is stay at home or safer at home, um, all of us, especially those who are vulnerable, will still be safer at home. Uh, social gatherings, uh, no greater than 10 individuals, will become the, the law of the land. And the anticipation is that next Friday, um, the 15th, is when phase one of reopening will occur. Next slide. So what does that look like? Uh, I'll just point you to the bottom of this slide where phase one is anticipated to last somewhere between two and four weeks. And that will all be uh, dependent upon what the, the data is showing us. You will see the little caveat at the end, two to four weeks, or longer. It's really up to us and whether our communities will continue to, to practice social distancing in a safe manner. Next slide. Phase two looks like this, just to point out, um, 10 goes to 50 as far as gatherings. And so if we get to that place, that means we have continued uh, to see great progress uh, in disease burden in our communities. That is also anticipated to last somewhere between two to four weeks, uh, but dependent on the data. Next slide. Phase three and final phase um, is called long term. Um, this would be in place uh, if we're, we're having no evidence of a rebound based on phases one and two. Uh, bottom of this slide says uh, this could be 10 to 12 weeks away. 
But once again, it's all in our hands, uh, literally. Next slide. There is a lot of data that is being looked at to make these decisions. And I just pulled out one of the slides uh, that they are, are using uh, and one of the metrics because I wanted to point out how complex the information is. So I just went over some slides that said, hey, we have 600 additional hospitalizations. Uh, we have 200 additional deaths. Um, we have 1,000 additional positive cases. How in the world are we making the decision to start loosening things up? Well, there are multiple things. Obviously, once someone contracts COVID-19, their disease can run anywhere between four and six weeks uh, is, the, is the average. So people who were being infected a month ago are actually becoming sick now. Um, so this slide here just looks at the number of tests. We are doing more testing. So the bars show the number of tests that are done on particular days. And then the yellow line and using the right side of the y-axis here, this shows you the percentage of those tests that are actually coming back positive. So you can actually see a downward slope of the number of positive tests as we actually test more people. Um, that is not a perfect measure, but it is one that shows some progress as we do more testing. Next slide. Testing. Uh, I reported out to you last week that there are two tests, molecular tests and antibody tests. And I wish I had a different update than what I had last week. The molecular test, once again, looks at uh, evidence of the uh, virus actually in your body at that point in time. It looks like the RNA of, of the virus. The antibody test looks at the, uh, the immune response from your body. Um, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot other than you have the disease. It does not confer and say that you are immune uh, in the future. It does not mean that you can infect others. And so uh, there, there's still not any national guidance on actually how to use that test in a helpful way. Um, but hopefully that'll be coming. Just to get back and reiterate a couple things that Brent said. Uh, number one, social distancing, social distancing, social distancing. If you're on this call, you are a leader within the community. Do not let people get maxidasical. It will send us in the wrong direction. It will harm people individually and it will harm our economy further. Continue to telework if we can. Continue with our cloth uh, face, face coverings in public. And as far as businesses, uh, screening for signs and symptoms, fever. If you don't have, um, if you don't have ways to, to measure uh, temperature with a thermometer, ask people to do that at home and document that um, as they come in. Uh, monitor shortness of breath and cough. And yes, still travel uh, as well. There are still hot spots around. Uh, the, the nation and we're supposed to be safer or staying at home and so traveling to other places around the United States is really frowned upon at this point as well. And obviously if someone's had a confirmed uh, contact with someone who has confirmed COVID-19 that would be a red flag and people should really not uh, be around them as well. Thank you for your time, stay vigilant and it's a pleasure to serve you. Thank you very much Michael. Greatly appreciated. And uh, again, thank you for the, the ongoing support from Central Perspective and, and please share our thanks with, um, you know, share our thanks with everyone in the Century system at every location because they're all, they're all doing their part to, to help, uh, especially as you kind of designate different locations for different services. So we appreciate it. All right, let's, uh, let's shift gears. We'll move from the, from the healthcare perspective to an HR perspective. And again, we have Rachel Tobin back with us. Rachel, thank you very much for, for being here again. And uh, it's good to see your smiling face this morning. And we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to you for some upside, up, uh, updates, excuse me, from the HR world. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Wendy and your staff for continuing to hold the Connect 40 webinars. The, all the speakers that you've had this week have been absolutely outstanding and I'm honored to be a part. Next slide, please. All right, there we go. Thank you. 
getting back to COVID, getting back to work with COVID-19. I've been asked to share my thoughts from an HR's perspective. And the key word here is with COVID. It's not after COVID or post COVID. COVID-19 will still be with us as we continue to get back to work, opening up businesses and back to the office. Some of us have still been at work, but maybe not been working, but not at work. So getting back to the office, as Brent and Michael said, it's very important to continue to be diligent about washing your hands and the face coverings and definitely the physical distancing. Next slide, please. I love the slide where it says avoid sleepovers. Why would that even need to be on this slide? Well, <laughs> it does because a local business had an employee who had a sleepover with a buddy so that they could get up early the next day to go hunting or fishing. Whatever it was had to be more important then both of them getting sick, exposing their families, coworkers, missing work, burdening their other coworkers, and unnecessarily burdening the healthcare providers. And yes, got a long Q-tip stuck up their nose at least twice. I saw a couple people at a bus stop this week. Granted, they must not have other transportation, and one had a mask on, but the other didn't. But hopefully they put one on once they got on the bus. Another story from a local company had a crew of workers who were strongly encouraged to wear their face coverings a couple weeks ago. The company started doing this and most of the employees did because they didn't want to get sick or take it home to their families. But two workers were like, no, I don't need to do that. It's, that's stupid. And guess who got sick? So this slide is very important now and even more so as we continue to open up the communities and going back to the offices. Next slide, please. This is an article that you can look up online. Leah Stiegler from Woods Rogers was with us last week, but I saw this article before that, and I can't encourage you enough to read the full article. Call the health department and just say hello or thank you, even if you haven't had cases. They have tons of information for you. They're very easy to work with. They wanna work with us. And if you end up getting a positive case in your company, they're gonna be the ones that are helping you through this. Of course, confidentiality is the most important as far as employees' rights. But it brings the question, what about coworkers' rights? Don't they have the right to know if they've been exposed? I've had interesting discussions recently with college-age young adults about the legal and ethical aspects of this. We all agreed that it's an ethical dilemma, and the definition of that is a situation in which a difficult choice has to be made between two or more alternatives, especially equally undesirable ones. So whose rights are more important? Can you find a way to maintain both? I say that yes, you can. There is a way to do that. Next slide, please. If if COVID hasn't hit your company yet, it's probably just a matter of time. When you get that first positive or maybe a false alarm, do you know what to do? We've talked about contact tracing, but how do you do that? It's, it's very hard. Ask yourself, what did you have for dinner three nights ago on a Tuesday? I don't know. If you're not keeping track of where you've been and who you've been exposed to, you're not gonna be able to do contact tracing. So it's very important to understand what's on this slide from the Virginia Department of Health so that you'll be prepared to, find, to provide that information. What's most importantly is it's against the law to discriminate if someone is positive or was positive. So an example would be a supervisor who finds out somebody at the company um, is homesick and through the rumor mill they find out it's because they're positive with COVID and then they say well don't put don't put the people that worked with him on my crew well now you're discriminating at, discriminating against people who were potentially exposed it's it's not wrong it's only human that that supervisor feels that way but it's against the law to discriminate even though um, you're not supposed to know who's, who's positive in the medical information, but you need to know what to do when it happens. 
This slide talks about isolation and quarantine and tells you the basics about exposure and returning to work safely after being sick. You need to understand this before it happens to you. Your life will be much easier. For positive cases, it's seven plus three. If you don't know what that means, you need to learn it. For exposure cases, it's 14 days unless you're an essential Okay, we, um, we were experiencing some technical difficulties. So we apologize on that. Uh, we will bring Rachel back in. Uh, I think we're going to have to go on to Crystal, though, if she's available to start. I'm ready. Um, thank you for letting me talk about taxes. I know taxes are not a popular topic <laughs> for most people, um, but I could talk taxes all day to anybody that would listen. Um, and there's a lot to talk about right now. Um, because of that, I decided to focus on a lot of the questions I've been getting in the last month. Um, I've had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with clients in the last couple of weeks about these topics that I've um, chosen to talk about. So I just felt like they were the most relevant. Um, I also wanted to preface um, by saying that this is the law as we know it right now. <laughs> Um, a couple of weeks ago, they were changing tax due dates on the daily. Um, so I was telling somebody something and then a day later, that information was irrelevant. So um, I just wanna make you aware of that. Just continue to stay up to date, um, have conversations with your CPA um, because things are changing rapidly. Um, the first thing I did wanna talk about is the due dates. So I think we all know that the new tax day is July 15th. Um, and I'll, it's important to know that that's the federal due date. Um, most states did uh, follow suit um, and they have the same July 15th due date. However, Virginia did not. They decided to make things very confusing and now the Virginia return is actually due before the federal return, which uh, if you know, you can't even, you can't do your Virginia return without doing your federal return. So it does make things very complicated. Um, if you still need more time to file after the new July 15th deadline, you can still um, file an extension as usual. That extension deadline is the same. They haven't changed that. That's still October 15th. Uh, if you pay estimated tax payments, um, they're normally due the first and second quarter. First one's due April 15th. The second quarter is due June 15th. Those are both extended to July 15th. So that's a lot of taxes. If you pay estimates and you normally owe, that's a lot of taxes to pay on July 15th. Um, I'm encouraging my clients that if they have the cash flow um, to pay their first quarter now if they can and not wait till July 15th, but um, that is the date if you don't wanna be subject to penalties and interest. Virginia, there are no changes to the Virginia tax filing deadline. So Virginia's tax filing deadline remained at May 1st, if you had not filed by May 1st, you received an automatic extension to November 1st. There was nothing that you needed to do. Um, that was an automatic, automatic process. But what's confusing is, oh, no, we're not done. <laughs> right. um, what's, what's confusing is the, um, the even though the, the 
Filing deadline was May 1st. The tax payment deadline was postponed to June 1st. So if you typically owe, um, I, would, I would consider filing before June 1st. If you usually get a Virginia refund, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, you can stick with that July 15th deadline. Um, to confuse things even more, there are a couple more dates to throw out. If you pay estimates, the Virginia first um, estimated payment is due June 1st. The second estimated payment is due 15 days later on June 1st. So now you have June 1st, June 15th, and July 15th. Very confusing, um, if you ask me. Um, Virginia Tax, I have read, has pledged to take a very liberal approach with um, income tax and estimated tax payments penalties. I don't really know what that is going to mean, but I do know for my office, um, my software automatically calculates um, penalties for late payments and not paying your estimates, and I'm going to suppress those. Um, I'm not going to voluntarily pay penalties. I'll wait and see what tax decides to assess at a later date. Next slide. One of the big changes in the CARES Act that happened relates to retirement accounts. So <clears throat> taxpayers can take up to $100,000 out of their retirement account um, for Corona well, they have to be coronavirus related distributions um, in order for the 10% penalty to be waived. So normally when you take money out of your IRA or your 401k, you're subject to a 10% penalty on the amount that you withdraw. Um, that's being waived. Um, you can take these distributions up until December 31st, 2020. I'm being told that you will be required <clears throat> to prove a COVID-19 proof COVID-19 affected you personally in order to qualify for this penalty waiver. So you had COVID, your family had COVID. Um, I think the final requirement is the one that most of us are gonna fall under. You were furloughed or laid off or your child is home and you had to become a teacher um, for the last couple of months. Um, how you're gonna have to prove that, I'm not exactly sure. They, they will continue to come out with guidance on that, but just want people to be aware of that because I don't think that's an obvious thing. Um, the other thing about it is you can choose to spread the taxes that you owe on your distribution over three years, or you could pay it all in 2020. So if your income is, is down a lot and you're going to be in a lower tax bracket, you may just consider, you know, paying it all in 2020, or just, you know, if you don't have the funds, you can spread it out over the three years. Um, alternatively, the CARES Act gives you up to three years to redeposit the money that you take out of your IRA or your 401k. Um, normally, that's a 60-day window. So if you take money out and you say, oops, I didn't really want that money, I'm, I'm going to put it back. Um, normally, you had 60 days. Now you have three years, which is um, a really long time to decide whether you want to put it back. Um, how that would play out, I think, is kind of neat, is if you decide to take out 10000 now because you really need it, you're not working and you pay the taxes on it in 2020, two years from now, you decide, hey, I've got this 10,000, I'm gonna put it back. You can go back and amend your 2020 tax return and take off that taxable distribution and get your money back, um, plus interest on what you pay taxes on. So I don't know how many people will take advantage of that. I, it, it's human nature, once you spend the money, it's hard to come up with it again. So once it's gone, it's gone. Um, but it is an interesting um, alternative if you are able to do that. Another final thing related to retirement plans is um, RMDs, retri required minimum distributions, are suspended for 2020. If you don't know what that is, it's probably because you're not 70 and a half. Um, if you are 70 and a half, you know what that is. You have to take out a certain amount from your IRA or your 401k. Um, and so if you don't wanna take advantage of that, if you, or if you don't want to take money out of your IRA um, or your retirement account, you should probably contact your custodian. Um, they have worked really hard, custodians, banks, and people who hold your IRA, they've worked really hard over the years to get that up on an automated process so that it's not forgotten. So now they kind of have to reverse that. If you don't wanna take it, they need to know because they need to stop that automated process. Um, 
But I do want to say before we go past retirement plans, um, I never recommend taking money out of your retirement plan if you don't have to, especially now that the market is down. Um, you're going to permanently lose those losses in your account. So if you don't have to and you have another option, I would highly recommend that, even though this is, a, you know, they've made it very flexible for you to use that money. Um, I still encourage you to take no distributions or the minimum possible. So. Next slide. The other very hot topic and I'll, why my phone doesn't stop ringing is the stimulus payments. Um, many of you maybe have already gotten it. Um, a lot of people have not. You will get a $1,200 um, stimulus payment for single, $2,400 for joint, and um, $500 for every child you have that's 16 and under. This amount is phased out if you make too much money. Um, I've had a lot of people really like panicking. I haven't got it. I haven't filed in years. Am I, is it going to be lost forever? Um, that's not the case. Um, they're actually, these payments are treated as an advance on your 2020 tax return. So you'll actually, this, um, the amount you qualify for will um, be a credit on your return. So all of us who've already gotten our money, it actually will, um, Kind of come back off it'll, it'll wash itself out and those of us who haven't gotten our money they'll get it so worst case scenario you may have to wait till 2020 um, but you will get it if you do qualify so um, i think some people once i tell them that they feel better so and because i don't think a lot of people know that um, another question i'm getting is are they going to be taxable and the answer to that is no they will not be taxable so what do you do if you haven't received your stimulus payment Go to the next slide. Go to irs.gov. I've been here a lot in the last couple of weeks. Um, so if you go to irs.gov and you click on get coronavirus tax relief, there'll be a link to check your payment status and that will take you to this page. And when you get to this page, you can click on get my payment and you will have to put um, your social security number, your date of birth, your street address and your zip code, you hit submit and it will give you the status of your payment. You know, some of them will show you a date of when it's gonna be directly deposited. Some will say you don't qualify. Um, what we're getting a lot of now, the people who haven't received it is, it will say you do qualify, however, we don't have enough information and you will need to enter your banking information. Um, we have done this a lot for a lot of my clients in the last couple of weeks, including my own mom. Um, and a couple of my employees. Um, so we've tested this out. We've entered the banking information and we're finding it takes, it takes about five to seven business days to get your refund um, into your bank account. After you enter that, you will have to have your adjusted gross income and whether you got a refund or you owed and the, that amount, you'll have to enter that information. And if you filed for 2019, you'll use your 2019 tax return if you haven't filed, you'll use the information from your 2018 tax return. Um, one last thing about this, I know when it was first coming out, they were saying, if you receive social security, we already have your direct deposit information, it'll go to that same bank account. That's not true. We have um, proved that false. Um, so if you haven't received it and you were relying on that information, um, I have an employee who normally owes, so the IRS has no reason to have her direct deposit information. However, she does receive Social Security and they did not have her direct deposit information and we put it in and she has gotten her refund. So um, if you haven't gotten your refund, I would encourage you to go to the irs.gov website and find out the status. And I probably need to stop on talking tax taxes for now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Crystal. What great information. I'm telling you what, every time we get on these calls, I learn something new and we've got some great questions. I'm gonna go ahead and um, interject them here and then we'll come back to have Rachel finish up at the end. But I wanted to get to a couple of questions. Crystal, since you just went up, I've got two for you. How okay. much PPP payment? So in other words, if a business did receive the PPP, how much should they set aside for implications? Implications being taxes. the taxes? Tax, yeah. 
All right, so what I've recently found out, they just actually came out with further guidance on this, um, April 30th. Um, the income will not be taxable, but the expenses that you pay with that income, so payroll um, mostly, um, that will not be deductible. So, you know, normally those types of things are a deductible expense, but the money that's, you know, you got, say you got $30,000 is from a PPP loan and you had $30,000 of wages, you will not be able to deduct those wages. They kind of offset each other. So depending, it's hard to say how much you should set aside, but know that, um, you know, whatever tax rate you're in, it would be a good idea to say you're in the 15% tax bracket to maybe set aside 15% or do some tax planning, call your, you know, your CPA and say, hey, can you run some tax planning based on the fact that this is what I got, I'm not going to be able to deduct this, you know, where is that going to be for income wise? So, you know, for people who have been still cruising along, income's fine, that could really affect them. For those where income's down anyways, that it could just end up being a wash, you know, where it may not end, end up paying more taxes. So it's really hard to quantify that because everybody's situation is so different, but I would definitely do some tax planning regarding that. So definitely, I, I hear what you're saying. You know, the advice is, is sound, is to seek your CPA, your financial professional ahead of time and kind of mm -hmm. have those discussions yes. now so you can be prepared. Okay, question number two for, uh, back to Crystal. When can Social Security recipients who have not been required to file taxes for 18 or 19 expect to receive the stimulus? This well, I would encourage them to, to go to that IRS.gov. Um, I would go there first. And then if there is no information there, there is, I, it, on that slide, you'll see there's the, the get my payment status. Right next to it is um, for non-filers to enter their banking information. So if you typically do not file, um, and you haven't filed in years, you can go there at any time. You don't have to wait. You could do that now and enter your banking information there. Um, now it does specifically say if you were required to file and you just chose not to file for the last several years, which there are lots of those people out there, um, you cannot use that application to just throw in your banking information and hope to get a stimulus payment. You have to, if you were required to file, you have to file in order to get your stimulus payment. Great. Okay. Good information. Now, one. Let's take another one for Michael. And um, this question is from Donna. Will there be any changes coming up soon to allow visitors to visit family in the hospital? And is Michael hey, still great on? Great question yeah. about uh, visitation. Um, as it stands right now, the current visitation policies will stay in place. Um, if stay at home uh, gets completely lifted um, and we still have a June 10th date uh, for that, we'll start looking at that. Um, but that's really going to be based in concert with uh, what the governor and state uh, announces as well. Uh, so just to reiterate, as of right now uh, and for the next several weeks for sure, uh, our visitation policies stand as they are, uh, which are uh, essentially no visitors, uh, unless we have a life or death situation going on. And uh, one visitor based on some life uh, moments uh, such as birth and uh, procedures. Um, we'll keep an, uh, an eye on that. Uh, we certainly want to get people back at the sides of their loved ones as quickly as possible. Um, but we're gonna have to wait to do that at the, uh, the, the right time. Great, well, we appreciate you, Michael, and keeping us informed on those regulations and uh, we'll look forward to better times ahead but we certainly want to be safe so thank you for that and uh, one more question we'll take right now for Brent's and um, this is on the phase four I'm not sure if you're hearing anything from um, uh, insurance uh, but on the phase four but business interruption insurance and I know that's that's so great and it's been so wonderful to have for businesses in the past but you know we understand that of course this is unprecedented we have not had this before so therefore it did not business interruption insurance was not covered for this um, COVID-19 uh, are you hearing anything out there that they're gonna fight for this 
in legislation? I have heard that being thrown around. Um, it's still way too early to know if that will be included or not. Um, if, if and when I hear more, I'll let you know to distribute out. Um, but right now, I'm hearing about it, but who knows what will be in that final version. Sure. Yeah. But thank you for keeping us informed. And, and we, we are in hopes that that will be added because uh, it certainly would help our businesses for sure. Okay. And on to uh, back to Scott and we'll hear the rest of what um, Rachel has to say from HR. Very good. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to everyone for, uh, for hanging in. Again, this is uh, great information from everybody and we want to make sure that we, uh, we have a chance to get the rest of the scoop from Miss Rachel. So let me go into the slideshow view here and we should be good to go. All right, Rachel, you back with us? I am, thank you, Scott. And I apologize for the technical uh, delay. And no problem. I'll be quick, I only have a couple more slides. And all of the information on this slide has already been discussed. Uh, go back one, please. Sorry. Back one, there you go. And just as, as we continue to move forward, we just need to be super, super diligent with all of these. And I think everyone's familiar with them. We'll go to the next slide. Now, something to consider is when you're opening back up or you're returning to the office, employees need to know what's going on. Please do everything you can to communicate with employees. If the answer is, I don't know, that is entirely okay to say. So when you're thinking about a return to work or return to office environment, think about the essential employees. They may already be working from the office with a skeleton crew. And then think about your at-risk employees, which we've heard discussed. And, you know, maybe they're the last ones to come back. Just have that conversation. And then always remember that employees that have been home with the schools, you can't just say, hey, you need to back, be back to work tomorrow in the office. They may need to arrange some childcare. So give them a couple days to do that and work with them and talk to them about it. Consider your policies. If you've had a no visitor policy to your office until the stay at home is lifted or some of the other phases get going, you may consider still still um, re keeping that no visitors to the offices policy in place. And then of course, you'll also have to start talking about business travel should only be absolutely essential right now, but you do need to discuss when that will open back up as well. And then as mentioned earlier, you know, are you gonna do temperature checks? So think about all those things. Next slide. And remember to maintain compliance with everything. Of course, for ADA, COVID-19 is, is not considered a disability, but EEOC, you really want to consider any accommodations, even though it doesn't fall under ADA. Just keep that line of communication open with your employees. Make sure they're comfortable and you're doing what you can to help them. FMLA, of course, COVID-19 is not considered a serious health condition under the regular FMLA. For the emergency FMLA and the emergency paid sick leave under the FFCRA, which is up to 80 hours, you can pay employees um, under those guidelines. And of course, DOL is our um, wage laws for proper pay. Next slide. One thing to consider, and in closing, I'll to my days for working for a new construction plumbing company in California and working for Kohler Kitchen and Bath at their Texas Vitreous Sanitary Factory, which means we manufactured toilets. Some companies have these, but not all. Consider retrofitting to a hands-free environment before everyone comes back to the office. Not only the soap and paper towel dispensers, but you can also get hands-free faucets so you're not touching the handles and you can get hands-free flushing for the toilets too. So think about that. And don't forget motion sensor light switches. Um, you're, not, you're not only gonna save on the germs for the, having to wipe down the light switches, but you'll save on electricity too for those that forget to turn off switches. But remember, getting back to the office or reopening your business is with COVID-19. And it's all about people, which means your employees, so communicate, ask them how they feel, ask them what their concerns are, maybe even survey your employees and ask them if they're ready to come back to the office. 
and remember to take it slow. Good luck to everyone. Stay safe. Shop early for paper products. And thank you for listening. And thank you to all of our frontline workers as well. We really appreciate everything. Thank you, Wendy and Scott. Thank you very much, Rachel. We appreciate you coming back and, uh, and sharing the additional information with us. Greatly appreciated and, and great advice. Um, from all of our panelists. So, uh, Wendy, we'll turn it back over to you to close and uh, maybe give us a little update on our last schedule, Connect 40. I can't believe it. Eight weeks has gone by, Ray. This is I mean, I it has flown by. We're, this is our seventh one, I'm telling you, next week. So, um, next week, speaking of that, uh, we have LaShonda with About Marketing, Selling Outside of Your Zip Code. Now, this is gonna be an awesome session with her and you're not gonna to wanna to miss it. So tell your friends, tell your family, tell your neighbors, tell everybody. Um, TBD Digital uh, with Wheeler Broadcasting, they're gonna talk about digital marketing right now and what is working, some new things, new techniques. So you don't wanna miss it. It's all about marketing next time. And of course, we're gonna bring back Michael with Centra Health and the update there so to keep us all informed on our area and where we are so thank you again for tuning in today i want to encourage you to keep on keeping on and know that when you're out there you know wear your mask but when you're when you're out there uh, helping others you're making a difference so just know that that every day is a new day and we need to all stay positive we need to stay informed we need to stay proactive stay connected virtually, and stay healthy and safe. So that's my encouraging words for you. We appreciate you as chamber members, as business uh, supportive members, and we look forward to serving you continually because together we truly are stronger. So we look forward to seeing you in person in the next month or two, but certainly we will keep on uh, these webinars and, and seeing you virtually. But again, we appreciate you and um, say thank you to your moms this weekend. Thanks again.